So, uh, so thank you very much for the invitation. Thank you, Jordino, Gonzalo, Diego. It's a pleasure and an honor to be here commenting such a good paper. I mean, I'm new in the bank, so I should have written that the views are mine, not those of the bank. Uh, so I think it's hard to overemphasize the importance of the topic of the paper and the theme of the conference in general. If you Google uh, Phillips Curve is alive or Phillips Curve is dead, you got like probably a, a, a record for the profession of 4,000 results. And the debate was busted during the Great Des uh, Recession because of the de missing deflation we observed in the US. And perhaps the missing deflation debate overshadowed the potential more structural role of the expansion in the international trade we observed recently. Uh, there was incipient literature that was hit by the onset of the Great Recession, and that paper speaks to this literature by showing that international trade weakened the relationship between inflation and economic activity in the US, and the authors do that uh, by showing a, a variety of evidence, aggregate, aggregate time series estimation of the Phillips curve, industry level estimation of the Phillips curve, and evidence from uh, identified uh, FAVAR. So I'm going over uh, some comments uh, on this, but before, I'd like to propose a framework to organize our, our idea, so I took the textbook, the Canadian model from Jordi's book. And the Phillips curve dynamics in the closed and the small open economies are exactly the same, except for the coefficient the author, uh, uh, the, the paper is interested in. In the small economy extension, you have that composite between domestic and foreign goods. Here I'm assuming that the elasticity of substitution between them is one. And that parameter nu can be interpreted as a measure of openness. I think what is nice about this version is that the closed economy is nested in the small open economy one. So if nu is equal to zero, we got the same dynamics in both economies. And the key inside that I think it's useful to, to, to read the results of the paper is that if the utility function has enough curvature, you are going to observe a flattening of the, the Phillips curve as the degree of openness uh, evolves. Uh, please, of course, here uh, uh, the connection is not direct because the US, of course, not a small open economy, but this is just a first glance between, compared between uh, empirics and, uh, and theory. So, of course, given that expansion of uh, the, the, uh, the international uh, the, the trade share, through the lens of the baseline or Canadian model, we should expect some flattening uh, of the Phillips curve over time. And once you interact that trade share with measures of output gap, that's what uh, Simon found in, in, in the paper. Uh, of course, any series with a steady trend might do that job. So, in, in, oh, sorry, I forgot to mention that. So, uh, it's more than that, uh, 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 that, the, that interaction can explain partially the declining pat, uh, pattern of the coefficients associating inflation economic uh, slack if you run a, a, a rolling window uh, regression. But of course, uh, any series with a, a, a steady, tra steady trend could do the job. So uh, to provide a more robust uh, assessment of, of the problem, they estimate some interest level Phillips uh, curve. So it's basically a pan estimation with the, 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 the Phillips curve. And then once they split the, the, the sample between low trade share and high trade share, they find that among the high trade share industries, uh, the, 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 the Phillips curve is flattened. So the obvious concern here, uh, the obvious concern here is about potential confounding factors for trade exposure. Of course, trade exposure correlates with other things. The first confounding factor that came up to my mind was financial frictions, precisely because 
of Simon's highly inflation research. So uh, if for some reason firms, uh, exporters are important, they face more stringent external finance uh, constraints. They might set their prices uh, for, for, for cash flow concerns. Another potential confounding factor is capital uh, intensity. So Sofia Balduco, my colleague here at the bank, uh, and her co-authors co has this nice paper showing that under costly cap capital mobility, uh, firms with low capital intensity tend to support more, so it might be a, 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 a another confounding factor. And the last thing the, the authors uh, did to, to provide more evidence of this flattening is that uh, uh, structural identification through the favor, I think uh, Simon will went over in details uh, about the, the, the strategy. And once you consider a, a shock to the financial conditions or a demand shock, you obtain a much lower, uh, we obtain a much lower, so, oh, sorry. How do, do, do I point here? Ah, here, okay. So uh, uh, once you consider a, uh, a high trade intensity industry, the response of the inflation to the shock is much more smaller than in the low trade intensity. If you look at the responses of activity are similar. If you look at the supply shock, you got the same results. The response uh, is attenuated for high trade uh, 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 industries and exacerbated for uh, low trade and response of activity uh, barely changed. So the question that came to my mind, so the, evidence, the bottom line of the FAVAR evidence is that the trade exposures attenuates the response of inflation to shocks. So the, 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 the next question that came to my mind was whether these findings would be consistent with the new Canadian Paradigm. So what I did, I took the textbook New Canadian Model from uh, Jordi's book, based on his paper with Tommaso Monacelli. I considered the textbook calibration coupled with the flexible CP CPI inflation targeting rule. Recall that the parameter nu governs the degree of openness in the in this small in this economy, and then I compute uh, IRFs and post-response functions in an economy with low trade and an economy with high trade. Of course, uh, the map between theory and the empirical exercise are far from is far from being perfect. Uh, perfect actually is is really perfect. But here, just one of first glance to see if this attenuation uh, and amplification responses will be consistent with an out-of-shelf new Canadian model. In my defense, this is the right model and device for the Chilean economy. So once you, you, you consider a discount rate shock, a demand shock, we got the, the attenuation uh, Simon Fine found in his paper, so in, a, in the high trade, it could be the response of inflation. It's much more attenuated than in uh, the low trade economy. The output gap also is uh, attenuated, but to a lesser extent. If you consider a technology shock, like a supply shock in, in this economy, you have some also some attenuation of the response of inflation uh, to the technology shock. The output gap will depend on the horizon you consider. And if you consider a monetary policy shock, uh, we don't find that attenuation you found in the, in the data. So if you consider a monetary policy shock with that, uh, with, with that rule I use, with the, the Taylor rule I used, uh, you get some amplification. Uh, you, you got some uh, amplification in the high trade economy. So the, my final comment, uh, re, my final comment regards these nice graphs. Uh, the paper also shows some evidence that during uh, recession, recessions, the relationship between inflation and economics back largely disappears. So here, 
Uh, I will take that picture to uh, advertise my own research. I apologize in advance for the shameless self-promotion. So I have these papers with a bunch of engineers. I'm the only economist in this paper that will try to forecast inflation using several machine learning methods. So what I'm reporting here is the results of this regression in which uh, we regress the difference of the pseudo out of sample forecasting error of that machine learning method, random forest, which is really linear with respect to all other models we consider. We regress on a, on a dummy uh, accounting for expansions and on a dummy accounting for, for recessions. I don't expect you to, to read these numbers. The bottom line, the takeaways, here at the following, the random forest method, which is highly linear, is the winner one. Most coefficients are neg negative. And more important and related to that graph, uh, the gains uh, of the random forest method seems to be coming from recession. So the magnitudes of the difference between the random forest and other model are much higher during recessions than do uh, expansion, I don't have, uh, uh, I don't know as exactly the, 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 the precise mechanisms. We are working on that. We are struggling to understand that precise mechanism that make the highly, this highly nonlinear method to beat other methods. But perhaps the interplay between uh, 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 nonlinearity and rich variable selection of some machine learning methods may shed, li may shed light on inflation dynamics during uh, downturns. So again, that's my job in the paper, as the other guys are, 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 are a bunch of engineers. So conclusions, this is a great uh, contribution. Uh, my view is that the paper provides many novel findings from a variety of perspectives. Altogether, this finding corroborates the view that trade reduces the responsiveness of inflation to output gap. Thank you very much.